All right. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Andrew Bagel. I'm a senior researcher at the Vibe Group. I'd like to welcome you to our feature presentation this morning of Sarah D'Angelo, who comes to us from Northwestern University. Uh, she is a PhD candidate there and is applying for a postdoc position here at MSR Redmond Lab. Um, Sarah uh, does a lot of work in gaze visualization. She's probably the world's leading expert on multiple people using eye trackers at the same time to try to solve pro uh, problems together. And uh, she has been rewarded with uh, like an NSF graduate uh, research fellowship. She also has a Google uh, PhD fellowship. So um, I think uh, she's going to impress us all with uh, some really cool uh, review of her research over the last few years. And she'll also tell us what she wants to do next should she come to Microsoft. So thanks very much. And I'll hand it to Sarah. Thank you. Thank you, and, and thank you all for coming. Um, today I'm going to be talking about designing gaze visualizations for remote collaboration. So start at a high level, technology-mediated collaboration and experiences are becoming more common, and they're creating new ways for us to work and learn together when separated by a distance. Um, and these can, technologies can improve access to expertise when people aren't co-located, and allow us to collaborate with colleagues in different countries or support people who want to work from home. However, these remote environments lack a lot of the rich interpersonal cues that we often take for granted in our co-located interactions. Um, for example, this woman is clearly feeling a little bit bored and frustrated, and that information isn't available to her remote collaborators in the same way that it is when they are co-located. And these rich nonverbal cues um, can help people understand their collaborators and their current mood and what they're attending to, which can facilitate richer communication. Because we rely on these nonverbal cues to support coordination and communication. So you do things like gesture and look at what you're talking about to support the ways in which we com uh, communicate. So in this example, you know, maybe this teacher or tutor is trying to explain a complex diagram and he's going to do a number of things. He might point at what he's talking about. He'll probably check to see if the student is looking there. And those ways they can confirm that they're following along and talking about the same thing and kind of can enhance our ability to collaborate when we know that we have a shared understanding and we're working together on the same page. So this brings me to the question that I've been focusing on for much of my dissertation, which is can integrating gaze information, which is an important nonverbal cue like many of the other ones that I mentioned, um, into remote environments support effective collaboration? So in this example, if you were working with this woman remotely, if you could see where she was looking in this shared problem, would that help you understand what perspective she's coming from, maybe what area she's focusing on in a way that can help you communicate about the problem together and help solve it. So would adding in this cue that's currently not available support our ability to collaborate and communicate effectively for these in remote environments, which are becoming increasingly more important? So to answer this question, I design, develop, and evaluate shared gaze visualizations. Um, these are a few examples from my research, which illustrate where someone is looking in a shared visual environment. So on the bottom left, you can see um, a teacher's gaze information projected over an, a lecture on cloud identification. Right here, you can see someone looking at a map with a magnifying lens and a tail. Um, so these are a number of different ways that illustrate how there's a wide range of ways that these visualizations can be designed, as well as a number of different tasks that they can be used to support in collaborative exercises. And I will talk about each of these in more detail, uh, but I just wanted to give you a heads up of what's coming. But what I'm trying to achieve with these shared gaze visualizations is to support gaze awareness. And gaze awareness is the collaborator's ability to understand what their partner is attending to in a, during a collaborative task with shared visual space. And this is important for a number of reasons and important for supporting fundamental features of communication and coordination, like establishing joint visual attention. So if I ask us all to look at the outlet in the back, um, some of you will look back there. Um, you'll probably check where I looked first and then look at that too. And I'll be looking there and you will too. And we'll have established joint visual attention on that object. I'll know you looked there. You'll have some understanding about where I looked. And then we can go forward talking about what I wanted to plug into the outlet, right? And for some of our remote attendees, you know, I don't have that kind of confirmation. I don't know if the people attending here remotely looked at the outlet with me, and therefore I might have to put a little bit more effort into communicating with them to ensure that we're on the same page. Whereas with these cues in our co-located environment, I know that Gina looked back at the outlet. I can continue talking to her about what's next without having to kind of put more effort into that communicative experience. 
Another thing that gaze awareness can help with is developing common ground or our ability um, to create a shared understanding. So in this example, if we were attending or visiting an aquarium together, which is something we probably do, since I love to scuba dive, I would look at this exhibit and I'd say, wow, a clown triggerfish, like, isn't that cool? And for some of you who I'm hoping there are a couple in the audience who don't know what a clown triggerfish is, you're probably very lost. And so I'm going to have to work a little bit harder to develop that shared understanding. I might say it's the black and white fish. Um, there are a couple on the screen, so that's still a little bit difficult. I might then do a little bit more work. I could say, you know, it's the black and white polka dot fish at the bottom. I could point at it. For those of you in the room, hopefully you know we're talking about this fish right here, highlighted in red. But that was a lot of effort, right? And so for those of you who were in the room with me, I did make a lot of glances towards the fish, which you could use as cues. I pointed at it, right? And so those cues helped you understand which fish I was talking about in the very complex visual environment. Um, and you could imagine, you know, if we were remotely experiencing this exhibit together, it'd be a lot harder. But if you had information about where I was looking, you probably would have figured out what I was talking about a lot faster because I was looking at the fish that I was pointing out. And this problem gets exponentially more difficult when you start to think about what happens when these fish start moving, right? And so this is one of the ways in which gaze awareness can help facilitate conversation in these rich environments where it's important that we know that we're talking about the same thing. Um, so with that in mind, um, what I'd like to talk about next are the results of a number of published studies um, that I will use to give examples about how gaze awareness can facilitate communication, why I think the design of gaze visualizations is important, how we can use gaze visualizations to bring out different aspects of collaboration that we want depending on the task, and where I see this going in the future and some applications for Microsoft. And to talk about each of these points, I picked out and selected a few results from a number of different studies. Um, however, there's a lot more to say about each of these different studies, so definitely ask questions at the end if you want any more information on any particular study or other analysis that was conducted. Um, but I'll give you some of the greatest hits, I think. So to start off, um, how do shared gaze visualizations impact remote collaborators' ability to communicate? So to answer this question and a number of other questions that I'll talk about in this talk, um, I developed a system to cross-project gaze data between collaborators in real time. So it's taking your gaze coordinates from an eye tracker and displaying them on your partner's display um, and screen in real time. And this has been modified for a number of different studies, but the setup looks something like this, where the collaborators are actually in the same room, but they're separated by a visual barrier to simulate a remote environment. So they can't see each other, but they can communicate freely. And in this first study, um, I asked participants to collaboratively solve a puzzle together um, with and without the ability to see where their partner is looking. And so what this puzzle looks like is an example on the right here. Um, you can see that they're putting together a puzzle of a puppy. This is sped up because in uh, the real experiment, this takes a lot longer. And you can see um, a participant's gaze information illustrated as that gaze cursor moving around on the screen. And so they're working together to solve this puzzle, and they have to communicate about um, the pieces that they want to combine. And for this study, um, it's important to know that we did both easy and hard puzzles. So an easy puzzle is an example of this dog here that has very distinct features. Dogs have ears and eyes and a nose that you can use to refer to those pieces that make it less complex. We did a hard puzzle, which is shown as, um, as a plaid puzzle, which similar to the fish example, is very linguistically complex. There's a lot of features that you could use to describe these, these pieces, and some of those features overlap with the other elements. So if I told you to move the blue piece, you'd be completely lost because all of those pieces are blue. If I tried to make it a little bit easier and said the blue piece with the orange bar, it would still be hard, right? Because there are a lot of other blue pieces with orange bars here. And so that's what I mean by linguistically complex. And like the fish example I started with, in those environments are where we would expect to see the benefit of these gaze visualizations, where it's difficult for me to communicate to you what I'm talking about. And the first thing that gaze visualizations are useful for are as a referential pointer. So when I say I think it goes with this one, um, right now you probably have no idea which piece this one is. Um, but if you could see where I'm looking, illustrated by this eye icon, which is enlarged so you can see it, you probably have a much better idea of what I'm talking about, right? It's now that piece in the upper left. Um, and so this is an example of using the gaze cursor as a referential pointer. I'm talking about something and I'm looking at it, and I use the word this. And my use of the word this is a deictic reference, so saying something like this, 
here, that are examples of deictic references. Um, and those are a rather efficient way to communicate about an object. So I could have said the blue piece with the orange bar on the upper left, that would have taken a lot longer, could have been confused with the other piece. Um, saying this is much more efficient because it's faster. Um, and if you understand it, we could move forward more efficiently. But it does rely on your understanding of a more abstract reference. So when we actually look at the language used by participants, we do see that the participants, when they could see where their partner are looking, are making significantly more deictic references with the gaze visualization than without. So they're taking advantage of this efficient reference form and using the gaze visualization to be able to communicate with their partner about what they're talking about. The other thing that gaze visualizations are very useful for is confirmation. So I used my gaze cursor to signal to you what piece I'm talking about. But now if I can see this from my perspective, I know that you've looked at that piece. And that can confirm that we're on the same page. You're looking at what I'm talking about, and I can move forward understanding that you know what I referred to. If you were looking at this piece, I know that I had some more work to do. I would understand that you're not on the same page as me, and I need to put a little bit more of a conversational effort into getting you to look at the piece that I'm referring to. And so these two features of communication are really great for facilitating effective collaboration. They're allowing us to use more efficient referential forms and verify that we're on the same page. However, the impact of gaze visualizations are not, or were not always beneficial. Um, unfortunately, there were some negative effects of the gaze visualization because they can be misleading. Um, in this transcript example, participant A is saying, you know, I think it's this one one that I'm looking at. They're trying to make use of the gaze visualization to refer to an object. However, participant B is confused. Your eyes are moving around a lot. They don't necessarily understand that reference. And that is due to a lot of things. Natural eye movements are very rapid. Um, so directly representing those gaze coordinates can be noisy. Um, remote eye trackers are affordable now, which makes some great avenues for testing this kind of work. But they do have some difficulties with noise and accuracy of the data. So those combined kind of can present you with a representation like this, where you can see that eye cursor bouncing around. Um, and it can be a little bit difficult to attend to all of that information while you're trying to collaborate on a complex task. So when they fail, it is because they have now misled the participant due to maybe misalignment. I'm now confused about which reference you're making, um, kind of noise in the data, which is making the signal very distracting. And so those are features of the gaze visualization that we don't want for collaboration. This is kind of introducing a headache into the remote collaborative experience that we'd rather avoid. But one thing that might be causing this is the design, right? Can this be attributed to the way that we represented where someone was looking? I chose this eye cursor, um, which is a direct re representation of the coordinate stream of where you're looking at, right? Which is kind of absorbing all of this noise and displaying that to you. What if we designed it differently? Could we kind of reduce the distracting characteristics of the gaze visualization and kind of come away with only the benefits um, and make it a more beneficial experience for remote collaboration? Um, which leads me to the next question. Can the design of gaze visualizations improve their ability to support remote collaborators? So if we change the design and make it more effective for the collaborators, can we come away with the beneficial aspects of gaze visualization without the harmful effects? And to investigate this question um, is research that I did here um, as an intern with Andy Bagel. And what we wanted to do here is look at gaze visualizations that are embedded to a specific context. So we're looking at to design a gaze visualization for remote pair programmers. And remote pair programmers are software engineers who are working on a code base together in real time, um, but they're separated by distance. So they're going to use tools like Skype with a remote desktop to be able to share their screens and talk about the code and edit it in real time together. And to understand the needs of these groups of remote pair programmers, we administered a survey um, with a bunch of software engineers at Microsoft, which revealed that one of the biggest drawbacks to remote pair programming is the lack of tools available to facilitate that interaction, to make it as rich it is, as it is in co-located pair programming, which is the predominant form of, of pair programming, is people like to be in the same room together. But people would like to remote pair programming because people want to work from home or be able to collaborate with people who are in different physical locations. So we thought maybe we could address this with a tool. Um, we conducted observations with co-located pair programmers to understand what they're doing well. And some things that you can do really well in co-located environments are refer to objects in the code or locations in the code together and understand that you're talking about the same thing. 
And so we wanted to take that ability of co-located pair programmers and introduce that to the remote environment. So we iteratively designed a novel gaze visualization, which looks like this. Um, it's that orange bar highlighted in the corner. And this is a really interesting design for a lot of reasons, right? Take, going from the eye cursor that was a direct representation of where someone is looking, we've now made it slightly more abstract. We've put it in the left margin near the line numbers, um, which was informed by the users because pair programmers are using line numbers to refer to locations in the code already. So if we put this over here as a referential queue, it's already near where they're expected to look, um, and they can use that resource. It's unobtrusive, so unlike the previous gaze visualization, it's not in the space that they're trying to edit. It's over in the margin of unused space, so it's not going to disrupt them from actually engaging with the code and doing their task. And we made it five line high to account for some of this error that I was talking about in the noisy signal with remote eye trackers. So if you're looking anywhere within this five line high region, the gaze visualization is not going to move, which is kind of naturally smoothing it out so that it's not this disruptive piece of information in your editor. And this is what it looks like in actual use. It changes to green when participants are looking at the same thing. And that was designed from the interviews where people you know, want to establish this joint attention. They want to know that their partner's looking with them at the same information. And so by turning it green, we can confirm to the users that the participant is looking with them. Yeah. Did you make that five line? How did you choose five? And was it adaptive at all in terms of the more someone's eyes jumped around, did you make it? bigger or smaller? It wasn't adaptive. Um, we did test a number of different lengths. Um, and based on the amount of code that we had here and the kind of size of the different functions, five seemed to be small enough that you get an idea of what they're referring to, but large enough to account for some of that error. I think given other um, tasks, we could have adapted that a little bit more. But that's how we came with that design. Um, What's the point of highlighting when you're looking at the same line, don't you, or the same area? Don't you know that already? Well, you might be able to infer if I you know, told you, hey, Gina, I think we need to look at this area over here at the tick timer tick function. And you, know, you might say, yes, I'm there. But by turning it green, we've made that very explicit to you. So you just have that confirmation. You might have seen it in orange, and you could assume that. Um, the change of color was just to provide a subtle cue that you're working together and just make that more explicit. And that's based on no, this is based on where you're looking. Oh, OK. Um, so to evaluate this design, um, one of the things that we did is kind of break apart that referential scheme that I initially talked about where I was looking at deictic references versus not. Um, but there are a lot of other ways that you can refer to locations in the code. So we've made this referential coding scheme that goes from implicit references like deictic references saying this or here to more explicit references like selecting text. And this was modified for the specific task. So we include things like line numbers, which are present in IDs that are not present in other collaborative environments. So this was designed for the task to understand in more depth how gaze visualizations are um, enhancing our ability to refer to locations in the code. And so in this example, I can make a deictic reference, and I can say I think we need to change this. Um, but you probably don't know what I'm talking about, and I can do a number of things to make that more explicit. Um, I could use an abstract concept, um, like I think we need to change one of the shapes. I could call it a specific word, um, like rectangle. But again, there are a number of instances of this, and so it's getting a little bit harder if you don't know exactly what I'm talking about to make that reference. And I could work um, a little bit more at you know, referring to the line number, saying that it's on line number five. Again, there are two instances, so it's still a little bit more complex. Um, and then I could go as far as to selecting text. So this is an example of how I can communicate with you from a range to, from explicit, implicit to explicit, depending on how I want to get you to understand what I'm talking about. And what we would expect is that with the gaze visualization, you're able to rely more on these implicit reference forms, these more efficient ways of communicating. And you might have to re rely more on explicit reference forms when we take away the gaze visualization, because you don't have that cue about what your partner is attending to. And so that's what we see when we look at the communication behavior. We see significantly more deictic references with the gaze visualization um, compared to without, which is consistent with the prior work. Um, and as we expect, we do see this trend towards more explicit references being made without the gaze visualization when we look at specific words. So program, pair programmers are using more specific word references without the gaze visualization compared to with ga the gaze visualization. Is there a uh, telepointer visualization in this as well? You can see the mouse cursor of your partner as well. Okay. It's also protected. 
Um, and we see this trend following for the remaining um, reference forms. Those two are the significant ones, but you can kind of see this trend towards more explicit references being made with the ga without the gaze visualization compared to with, which is what we are hoping for. And the other great part about this is that, yeah, did you have a question? Are these all one-off statistics? I'm wondering about how people's behavior would change over time. Like once they have this available to them, do you, I, mean, I would guess there would be a big change in their behavior as they adapt to how they right. get home. Yeah, so these were um, from 10-minute tasks, um, refactoring tasks with pair programmers who had worked together. Um, but you could imagine, if this was a more longitudinal study, how their familiarity with the gaze visualization would change how they used it. Um, fortunately, we haven't done longitudinal study yet, but I do think that's an interesting avenue to go down uh, when we can look at the familiarity. Yes. So is there thoughts about like how much more efficient than is like than just sharing a cursor? Like, you know, mouse, it's kind of pretty natural for us to be able to control where we're what we want to focus on and look at versus the gaze we'd have to learn a little bit. But right. um, like I was wondering if you had insights around that. Yeah, so I think, you know, when we talk about referential pointers, you kind of can make that metaphor to a mouse and you can make that explicit gesture. Um, what's interesting about the gaze cursor or the gaze visualization is that you also get these kind of different process behaviors. Um, so you can start to think about what people doing, what people are doing that isn't explicit. So you're not always reading with your mouse cursor following you. But when I can see where you're looking, I know where you're attending to without having to ask you to point that out for me. So it's a little bit more natural and faster. Um, and what I'll get to actually next is other ways in which gaze visualizations can point out these more process level cues that you don't get from explicit gestures with a mouse, kind of how I'm interpreting the information um, and how I'm processing it that's different from these explicit reference forms. And I'll get to that in a little bit. That's a good question. And just to be 100% clear, you saw the other person's cursor in both conditions. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, right, and so building off of this, one of the great things, in addition to this more efficient communication form is that participants reported that it wasn't distracting. Um, so they felt that it was a subtle cue that wasn't disrupting them from their task, which is what we wanted to achieve. And so this has motivated um, a new line of work for me, which is on this more creative and iterative design of gaze visualizations. Um, and I am currently advising an undergraduate researcher, who Jeff Brewer, who will be presenting this work as a demo at CHI. Um, so I'm very proud of him. But what this is showing you is the same um, coordinates, gaze coordinates visualized in four different ways. And so what this is getting at is the differences in gaze patterns that you can visualize with different features. So you can see in the upper right, um, a heat map will show you that the places where I fixated the longest were the corners. But in the bottom left is going to show you my trajectory through the space so you can understand how those, each of those positions connect to each other. Whereas you know something like these two are going to be um, have less pass information, so they're not going to start occluding the visual space, but the one in the top is going to show you direction, whereas this one's just going to show you a current position, right? And so you can think about the things that you want to illustrate. Does it, is it important for your task to know how long I look somewhere, or does it matter how I traverse that visual space? Um, and that's the things that you can start to think about when you vary the design of these gaze visualizations and start to investigate them more um, when thinking about what of the many features of eye movements that you want to visualize. Um, so Iris um, is the platform that we've developed. It is a direct manipulation interface. So you can see in the top, um, you interact with your fixation point by dragging on it. Um, you can adjust the fill um, to kind of, and test this out with your gaze coordinates in real time. So you can interact and test a number of different designs. You can drag out the tail to show the different previous fixations that you want, and that, that length can depend on you know, how much previous fixation duration you want to show, so how you've traversed the visual space. You can change the representation to show dots connected by lines um, and adjust the different size and fill of each of those points. Um, so if you want to show representations that change as you've looked through the visual space. And so with all of these different elements, you can kind of imagine a lot of different ways to create gaze visualizations um, that we've made open source for researchers to kind of investigate these different visual visualization forms and also support this iterative testing. So like you saw in the previous example, I can record my gaze information and then play it back in a number of different techniques and decide which one's going to support their collaborative task. So to understand this design in more detail, um, this leads me to the next question, which is, can the design of gaze visualizations elicit different types of collaborative behavior? So this is some of the things that I'm getting at with this more in-depth approach to gaze visualizations that we can take 
um, from a more implicit level that are different from mouse cursors. So what can we say more about the collaborative behavior between the pair rather than just our communication forum? So kind of going a level deeper into how pairs are actually collaborating together. Um, so to investigate this question, I wanted to know how different gaze visualization techniques impact collaborative searching behavior. So this is starting to look at the same task, but different visualization techniques. So what you can see here is an example of a hidden image task. Um, so this is a search task, and there's a, like, a candy cane hidden here in the tree. Um, and so for reasons that I've explained earlier, this is kind of linguistically complex. Um, it's not simple to point out the candy cane. It's embedded in the tree, so it makes it a little bit of a harder search task. And what I did here was design three different gaze visualizations. So you can see a heat map um, right here, which is going to darken the color when you stare at some place for an extended period of time and also show your past 14 seconds of eye movements. So you can kind of get coverage and duration. The next one over is going to be a shared area visualization. Um, so this is kind of a new technique, which is only going to display this circle when we're looking at the same area together at the same time. So this is kind of capturing when we're jointly attending the same area, um, but isn't going to be displaying the gaze visualization at all times. So it's only going to happen when we're looking together, um, which is an interesting element of gaze visualizations because most of them are always, always available to you at all times. And so to avoid maybe some of the distraction, we can make this available only when you want to coordinate. And what participants can do here is activate the visualization by directing their partner to where they're looking. Um, and this will display. And one of the interesting things here is that, you know, rather than needing to use a lot of language, since natural eye movements happen so quickly, if one participant stays constant, then the next part, the other participant can scan the space quickly, and then that, that visualization will appear. So this makes use of more efficient reference forms, but is displaying it in a partially available way. And the last visualization is a path visualization. So it's showing you the current fixation point illustrated in black. Uh, connected to a previous fixation point illustrated in red. So this is going to show you some connections in the visual space as well as where your partner is currently looking in real time, which is um, more comparable to the first visualization that I showed you. Um, to evaluate this, I did a within subjects design. So every participant um, interacted with each of the different visualization techniques, and we counterbalanced the orders for that. Um, and we measured a number of different things, but what I want to talk about right now is joint visual attention. Um, so the example that I brought up earlier about us looking at the same thing together um, is what I'm trying to illustrate here. So you see two different gaze paths, one in orange, one in green. And what's happening at points four, five, and six is that we're looking together at the same place at the same time. So we're attending to this information together. And this is important for a number of different collaborative activities. So you can imagine scenarios where you're teaching someone something and you want them to attend with you, right? So I'm explaining something complex and I want you to be following along with what I'm talking about, and we want to be jointly attending, right? And then you can think about environments where this might not be as beneficial, like collaborative search, where a more effective searching strategy is a division of labor approach. If you search the top and I search the bottom, we're going to be able to scan the page in half the time working together. And so what is designed here is to bring out both of those elements when we want to jointly attend and when we don't. So for the beginning search part before we find the object, it's going to be beneficial for us to separate and divide the space. But once I find the object, we're then going to want to jointly attend so I can help you locate it as well. Because the only way for us to move on is for us both to find the object. So it kind of gets at both of those dynamics of collaboration. One where we want to be looking separately and one where we want to look together because we're coordinating on an object. And what we're hoping to see here is, or what we expect to see is that the different visualization techniques are going to elicit these different types of behavior, supporting joint attention or not. And so our measure of proportion of overlap in time, or the amount of time we spend looking at the same information at the same time, shows this difference. Um, so with the shared area visualization, we see significantly more overlap compared to something like the heat map visualization. And this can be attributed to the design. The shared area design is encouraging us to look together at the same time, because the only way that we can make use of that visualization is if we're jointly attending to the same information. Whereas the heat map is going to discourage that kind of behavior. By visualizing where I'm looking 
in the search area, I'm starting to occlude the space where my partner is looking. And so by looking there, I'm not going to actually see the objects underneath. I'm just going to see that my partner's already scanned that space. So that's going to encourage me to look elsewhere because I know the spaces that they're traversing and I can go somewhere else. And so we do see significantly less overlap with the heat map, um, similar to none. And path lies somewhere in the middle. And with previous work, we do expect that the path visualization being an always on visualization technique is going to attract your attention a little bit more than nothing. Um, and when we talk to participants about this, we do see this kind of behavior um, kind of validated in their responses. So with the path visualization, participants are saying that they couldn't help but follow it, right? This is kind of a description of this distracting effect that we saw earlier. Um, whereas the, with the shared area visualization, we see that participants are saying that they're able to do their own thing, but just target the objects together. So they're able to kind of work separately, but when they want to come together and coordinate, then they're able to make use of the visualization. So they're able to do this tightly coupled action when they want to. And this is a, an example of how we can kind of tailor these visualizations to support the specific task. So we want a visualization that allows for some separate activity, but then really shines when participants are trying to collaborate. And so when we look at survey results, we see that participants you know, while they're able to attend to where their partner's attending with the path visualization, they report it being distracting, right, which is something that we saw in the first study. But we're not seeing that with the shared area visualization. Didn't distract from the entire task, um, and they were able to use it to facilitate coordination. Um, and then we do see that they're both rated equally as useful. So people are kind of willing to deal with this distracting element if they're able to use the path visualization as a referential pointer. But it would be great as we see in the shared area visualization where we don't have this distracting element to it, but we do have the usefulness. So we can start to think about tailoring these specific designs for the context and what kind of collaborative behavior we want to support. And building off of that, another thing that we can do with gaze visualizations um, is try to model appropriate eye movement behavior. So you can imagine using gaze visualizations in, a, in training exercises or learning. Um, and so this is, gets at another kind of element different to cursors and direct kind of inputs is that gaze visualizations provide some insights into how you're processing the information that can be useful. So for this study, it designed a lecture on cloud identification. Again, clouds are more linguistically complex than maybe other types of visual information. There's not um, a, a clear way to describe a lot of their individual features, um, but there are important differences between clouds. And so to evaluate how gaze visualizations can help people model expert-like um, gaze behavior, we implemented a visualization of where the teacher was looking. So you could see how the teacher was looking at the lecture slides and the gaze information compared to a pen um, which is just going to be an overlay of a pointer, which is also used in online lectures, um, and a baseline of no visualization. We did a between subjects evaluation because we wanted to use the same stimulus for all of them. Um, and we evaluated a couple of dimensions of learning since we did these with potential learners and contextualized it as an online lecture. And like I was saying with clouds, there are distinct features to them. Um, so we chose clouds because they have, there are different cloud types that kind of have different features. So you have horizontally forming cloud types like stratus clouds or sometimes clouds that generate, that have rain that are going to layer across the sky. Whereas clouds like cumulus clouds are going to extend vertically into the sky. And so these different features are something that we can easily pull away from the eye movement data and look at your horizontal saccades and your vertical saccades. And you should be looking or effective cloud identifiers can look at the different cloud types in the way that brings out these features that can help you distinguish the different cloud types. So when we look at student behavior, what we see is when you can see a teacher's gaze visualization, which is clearly illustrating a horizontal saccade pattern, um, that participants, when they can see where the teacher is looking, are making a higher proportion of horizontal saccades on horizontally forming clouds um, compared to vertical saccades. So they're kind of making this difference, where when you're looking at a horizontal cloud, you're making more horizontal eye movements. Um, and this difference is not present for the pen and no visualization condition. And this results are from the post-test. Um, so students watched the video lecture and then they took a post-test and we looked at their eye movement behavior. And so this demonstrates that 
you know these subtle differences in eye movement behaviors, which are potential signals or expertise, where people are going to look at the right cloud type with the correct kind of formation, um, can be taught by showing students where the teacher is looking. So you can start to model this behavior that then can, students can pick up on by illustrating the important features. So in this, in this task, a design that connected the two different points is important because then we're clearly illustrating horizontal lines versus vertical lines. Um, and those illustrations can become clear to students and help them distinguish the different cloud types. And we also see this difference when we look at learning behavior. So this is an example of a scoring grid um, where students got a point for identifying the correct cloud. Um, it's important to note here that you got half credit for being in the correct family of clouds. So if you, were, you, know, if you identified that it was cumulus, you got half credit. They were also broken up by altitude, so we gave half credit for that. And we do see that participants score significantly higher on their post-test when they can see where their teacher is looking compared to no visualization. The pen visualization it lies in the middle, and it's not significantly different from either of them. But these results are encouraging in the sense that the visualization was able to help students identify characteristics of clouds that could then help them differentiate them. And this is something that the gaze visualization did well, that the pen visualization maybe wasn't necessarily addressing as effectively. Um, so this is an interesting avenue for gaze visualizations in a more applied setting when we think about um, online learning. Um, so to summarize the results so far, we see that gaze visualizations can support effective referential communication between remote collaborators. So we are seeing that when you can see where your partner is looking, you're able to make these more efficient referential forms, which are going to allow us to collaborate um, and communicate a little bit faster. Um, contextually relevant gaze visualizations can prove their effectiveness. So when we take the context into consideration, like when we think about designing specifically for Visual Studio and pair programmers, we can improve the effectiveness of these gaze visualizations. We can reduce the distracting characteristics while capitalizing on the beneficial communication aspects. Um, and different gaze visualization techniques can be used to support or encourage establishing joint visual attention. Um, so this is one of the ways that you can think that about how the design of these gaze visualizations can be used to support or encourage the type of collaborative behavior that you want to elicit from your remote collaborators. So if it's important that we're attending together, you might want to design a gaze visualization that is going to encourage us to look at the same information together. Um, whereas if we want to support people maybe working separately, but, collaboration, but collaborating um, at different points, we could think about visualizations that discourage joint attention and kind of help support participants when they're trying to divide the space, and they just want to cue where their partner is, and they know what areas their partner is looking on, and they can work on other areas. So this is an example of how the design of these visualizations can bring out these different kind of collaborative behaviors. And for application spaces, gaze visualizations can help students follow along in MOOC-style video lectures. They can be used as an intervention in these online learning platforms to help students follow along with visually complex information. You can think of a number a different type of, types of training exercises which might benefit from visualizing where an expert is looking to help give you information about how they're processing that visual information and potentially ways that you could start to replicate that kind of modeling. And what I'm working on right now in my most immediate future work is how gaze information can support collaboration between groups. Um, and this is an interesting problem because the majority of this talk, I focus on dyadic relationships, so relationships between two collaborators, where I'm just giving you information about where your other collaborator is looking, and you can use that to work together. But this problem becomes more complex when we introduce more people to the collaboration. And so then signals about where the group is looking can be used to make other kind of determinations about group behavior. So where is most of the group looking? Where are the outliers looking? And what does this say about the entire collaborative experience? between the group. Um, so to understand this a little bit more, we've developed a system for visualizing multiple gaze coordinates in real time. Um, so this example shows three um, computer science students trying to identify bugs in the code. And what you can see here is that two of the students have moved on to the next problem, and one is still staying up here. right? And so when you visualize the group information, you're then able to target these outliers and these differences. So when we showed this, to teachers who were leading the session, um, they were able to provide more targeted feedback 
to the students that were falling behind. So the student who needed a little bit more explanation on what they should have seen in that output was able to kind of get that feedback because the, student, the teacher was aware that they were still looking at it. And this is kind of information that the student wasn't necessarily communicating to the teacher. So this is one of those things that you get from gaze visualizations that might not be explicitly mentioned to teachers, which is, you know, I'm still struggling and I'm still up here looking at the same problem while everyone's moved on. And so then you can kind of address that student more directly um, and help kind of provide them with the information that they need to move forward. These are some of the interesting things that we can do now that it's become a group. So you're able to do more of a high level distinction between the differences in the group behavior um, rather than just the one person you're collaborating in real time. So you can make comparisons into you know, who's behaving similarly or differently and how do I need to address those individuals um, and what is the higher level class doing? So how can I, you know, you can use this to monitor more students. And there, there are interesting aspects in how we can think about how this scales, right? This is three students, but what happens when we get to 20 or 200? And those are aspects that you can start to think about visualizing the average student um, and then displaying outliers as deviations from that average. Um, so a lot of ways in which this group visualization technique can evolve to support larger groups and also display more interesting characteristics of how people are engaging with remote content together. And I started this talk talking about nonverbal cues in general. Um, I started at a higher level thinking about things like gesturing and facial expressions in addition to eye gaze. And I focused primarily on eye gaze for my dissertation, um, which I think has been an interesting way to start. However, um, I do want to explore these other nonverbal cues. So eye gaze is just one of many, and we can think about the possibilities of incorporating a suite of nonverbal cues. If you think about where you're looking, as well as what your facial expression can tell us about how you're feeling. Um, maybe if you start pointing at things, what your body position might tell us about how you're engaging with the content. And gather these nonverbal cues together and make them available in remote environments, I think is a rich direction for this research. And taking away some of the elements that I've talked about today, um, going forward with other nonverbal cues, there are interesting ways to measure them measure their effectiveness in terms of how people are communicating. Um, we can also think about you know, more social implications of this work, if people are able to develop rapport with each other, um, and what that looks like when you make these social cues available to people. And building off of one of the main focuses of my work, how should these, these nonverbal cues be designed? Um, so direct, explicit representations of the eye movements were not necessarily the best way to represent those, and maybe more abstract, contextually relevant, Design techniques are important, and those can be applied to other cues when you think about facial expression or heart rate or body position. What are kind of maybe more abstract ways that we can integrate those into the shared workspace that can make them more effective and potentially not overload people with information? So this is an area that I want to go into, um, but I plan to use my background in the gaze visualization techniques to inform how I go about integrating other nonverbal cues. This is a lot of applications for a lot of the tools that Microsoft works on um, when we think about Skype and different meeting applications. Integrating nonverbal cues into these environments can enhance that experience when we try to think about how distributed teams work together, especially when we think about potentially groups of co-located people in addition to a remote collaborator or you know, groups of remote people integrating with groups of co-located people. So how can we share the, the nonverbal cues of the group to their remote collaborators, how can we make these remote experiences richer um, rather than maybe just showing one look, view into the, point, into the scene? Could we provide more information about the group dynamics and how people are engaging with each other and the information to make it easier to collaborate remotely? Um, as well as applications for augmented reality. Um, so a lot of the work that I've talked about today has been primarily computer-based and screen-based, um, but you can start to think about how gaze visualizations can be used in physical tasks. Um, so when we get more complex visual, physical tasks like um, assembling objects, you can start to think about how <coughs> gaze visualizations can help guide people through that process. Uh, maybe if you think about more physical um, tasks that are harder to describe, like playing sports together, you know, someone who's very good at golf might not have the words for describing to you how you should do a swing correctly, but where they're looking will probably provide insights into how they're able to do that kind of action. And so we can start to think about ways in which augmented reality can integrate these nonverbal cues to support remote collaboration on physical tasks, as well as things that require um, kind of more bodily movement. Um, and 
the space as well for other nonverbal cues to be included in these rich um, remote environments that go beyond the screen. So those are some things that I'm really excited about for my future work and I think are obviously things that, that Microsoft is doing really well here and can start to build on. Um, and with that, uh, I want to acknowledge the very talented undergraduate researchers who I've advised at Northwestern um, and whose research and talent has contributed to some of the results that I talked about today, as well as my <coughs> advisors, um, Darren Gerbel and Mike Horn, um, for their support throughout my dissertation work. And for all of you for attending, um, and I'll happily answer any questions about the work. Yes. Um, so you talked in the earlier studies a lot about the efficiency of the communication. Did you find any differences in terms of the output or the quality or the, um, in, in terms of performance? Right. Yeah. So we looked at performance um, in the first, the puzzle study and did not see a time difference, um, but I'll pull up a slide for you that can address that question. Um, which I think was attributed to some of the distracting characteristics. But when we look at the, um, the second study where we really see this difference, while again, we don't see maybe an average completion time difference, we do see a coordination period difference. And what I mean by coordination period is, so you have the total collaborative time, and then we have the time from when the first participant finds the object to when the, sec when the second participant finds it. So this coordination period where I found it, now I need to describe it to you, that's where we see the impact of the visualization. So they're really helping this rich, this tight coordination. So once I find something and I need to explain it to you, then I do see this performance increase. However, overall, we do not see a performance increase, which could be due to some of the complexity of the task. Um, it's a very difficult search task. But again, and again, you know, we're, we're thinking about tasks that take on average three minutes, so sometimes it's hard to get those performance results, but we do see it in that coordination, but I think that there is an opportunity to look at this in, in more depth. Um, we did see the learning gain example where students were able to score higher on their tests with the gaze visualization, but I think there's opportunities building off of this more longitudinal study to think about, you know, what does the code quality look like for the pair programming example, if we think about people using this tool more long term. Um, as well as maybe longer collaborative tasks. It's a good question. And then in terms of, so performance numbers are good, but also kind of that qualitative um, experience, mm -hmm. um, like in the pair programming or in this task, what was the what was the change in qualitative experience? Yeah. So when we looked at um, when we asked participants about the gaze visualization, some of these results from earlier. Um, where we see, you know, participants find them useful as well as distracting, but we did kind of dive a little bit deeper into, you know, the heat map not being a very effective visualization. It was, you know, visually very cluttering for them. While it did kind of signal where their partner was looking, it ended up being kind of disruptive for participants, as well as a lot of participants reporting that the path visualization was distracting. However, they do acknowledge the utility, right? When they do this exercise without gaze visualizations, it's a lot harder for them to describe the location of the object. So there's this feedback around um, it, its usefulness in terms of pointing. When we did the pair programming study, we asked participants um, about their experience with it. And I'll pull up a couple quotes from that as well. So they're able to kind of get a, a sense of where they're looking, which they kind of interpreted as a replacement of pointing because they didn't need to confirm where they're looking. Um, we did see people report more preference to the gaze visualization rather than having to rely on line numbers. Um, so we do get this more kind of experience difference when we think about people's effort they had to use to refer um, to locations and kind of the subtle cue of where their um, collaborator is looking. And we did have them fill out a survey. They reported that they felt like their collaborator was focusing on the document more when they could see where the visual see the visualization um, versus not, and so that might have been a, a signal that, you know, when I see a gaze visualization, it's this direct confirmation that you're looking at the document and engaging with it, which isn't available when I don't see that. And so, whether or not they were actually focusing more, gaze visualizations can provide this cue that your partner is looking at the screen; they're not, you know, texting or doing something else. So, from that kind of perceived benefit, do you see that? 
So <clears throat> with regards to the jumping around, um, is there an option to maybe average over a time window uh, to maybe smooth that out? Yeah, um, so we did that. Well, with the, with the programming example, it's kind of, we have the line numbers to kind of account for that kind of subtle movements. And there is, we've done some smoothing functions where you have to move further enough away from the previous point in order for us to display it, which kind of accounts for some of the small movements. But you could think about a time window as well. Um, I focus mostly on, on distance, um, but I think that that would, be, that would be interesting. And as well as when you think about you know, more asynchronous collaboration, where you can use what's coming in the future to kind of determine what information is important. That's a good point. Yeah. Um. Maybe you said this earlier, but were you using, uh, was the primary input tool for all of this gay stuff, the cameras on the PCs? Uh, they were remote eye trackers. Oh, okay. um, so we used um, kind of external eye trackers, which are okay. attached to the, the bottom of the monitor. Okay. Yeah. Has anyone used this with autistic kids? Um, it has been used <coughs> to look at how autistic children um, watch videos, and so you can kind of determine autistic children from typically developing children based on where they're looking in the scenes. So you see kind of, you know, maybe more fixations on faces with... Um, like the teacher experiment, or, yeah. Yeah, we ha it hasn't been used in these more real-time settings. Um, eye tracking in children with autism has been used to kind of understand their scene perception and reading behavior, but I think that's it's an interesting opportunity for improving these kind of personalized learning experiences where you can get this sort of subtle cue about where people are attending and then know maybe more about what you need to share with them. That can be an alternative to other forms like facial expression or something. So that's a, that's a good point and something I haven't looked at yet, but I think would be an interesting opportunity. Uh, if, if I know that my partner or collaborative partner can see where I'm looking, am I going to try to use my eyes as an input device then? And is that going to be weird and awkward? Yeah, so that, that's an interesting question. Um, when we look at referential behavior, we do see that kind of like, like with the, the transcript from the puzzle study, someone says, where I'm looking, right? And so it's clear that they're looking at it and then saying, where I'm looking, that's where you should be using it. And so there's kind of that pointer behavior, um, which I think is apparent in, that, in the referential communication style. But I think you do get into these more naturalistic kind of interactions because eye tracking is pretty non-invasive. It just, you're not necessarily aware of it happening. So you do get all of the other parts of interacting that aren't, I'm not always cognitively aware that I'm making pointing movements with my eyes. I think it happens when I'm making an explicit reference, but it's not going to happen, you know, I'm not going to tailor my searching behavior because you also have to use your eyes to process the visual space. Um, in ways that are going to help you do the task, then you can use it as a pointer. That, that where, I, where I'm looking thing, I don't know, sounds problematic to me. It sounds, this is something I would never do if Corey and I were shoulder to shoulder at a task. I would never, ever say it's the thing that I'm looking at. I would point to it, I would move the cursor to it, but... Right. but that's just weird. <laughs> yeah, I think um, that's an interesting and, point. And, and I wonder if it, if it comes from having both the eye position and the cursor position represented, because then I have to disambiguate which cue to use. Right. Or, or if it's just that, that you're trying to get too much mileage out of eyes. Yeah, I mean, I think that there is an interesting point to be made that like you're not going to make reference to where you're looking in co-located interactions, but Corey might use that information about where you're looking to kind of help her. Sure. So while you might, in co-located interactions, you don't necessarily look at it as, use it as a direct cue. The people around you are using that to understand what you're attending to. And so I think that that has been one of the strengths of looking at more abstract representations, because with the, with the first example of the eye cursor, it is very much like simulating a mouse. And in that way, I'm using my eyes to both engage with the task and refer to objects, and there's this interesting question around, you know, what was a communicative eye gesture and what was just me searching? And so those are interesting questions for when we start to think about different ways to visualize. So with the pair programming example, you know, that's not going to be in your face as much, and so you kind of have a sense of, all right, you know, I know my partner is looking down here, I can check on them, and then we have this color change to kind of use it as kind of like a signal. 
Um, and so I think there are ways to design that out, like with the shared area visualization. You know, it's not, we're able to do our own thing. And then when I say, do you know, look in the up right, up top right, then you, we activate it and then we're able to target it together. So I think that there's a place for, the, for both to exist, but it does come down to, you know, the design in some sense that we're not trying to replicate a cursor, but it's a good question. I think John had a question. Yeah, sorry, John. So let's see. Um, I'm going to ask a question about you've done work that looks at gaze reference among two different people. I'm wondering whether you thought about it applying to conversational agents. Hypothetically, we might have an interest in conversational agents helping you and with knowing where I'm looking, you know, inform that. Yeah, so I think, I think then, you know, we can start to think about models of, of conversation. And when we think about looking at what I'm talking about, then conversational agents can start to use that information, you know, to understand what it is I'm referring to. I think Sean Andrus, who was hired here last year, did an interesting study with a conversational agent instructing a person to build a sandwich. Um, and the participant could then see where that agent was looking, and they could use that information to refer to the objects together. So it can facilitate conversation in the same way that it does in co-located in interactions. I think we just have to have an understanding of, you know, like Gina was saying, when I'm using my eyes to signal to you what I'm talking about, when I'm using them in junction with what I'm thinking about versus when I may be using them more independently. But I think there's definitely a space for that. Yeah. So going forward, if you're talking about extending this to be other types of nonverbal communication, um, how do you think you can do that in a way that doesn't get overwhelming? Mm -hmm. Because right now you're sort of giving me one additional piece of information. Um, in the real world, we're able to to sort of piece all this together over our, our years of development. Mm -hmm. um, but how can you present this without completely distracting the, the task that I'm trying to do? Right. And I think that's an important question and something that has become apparent through this design process with gaze visualizations is, you know, how to not be disruptive. And I think, you know, there we did a study with Iris where we had people design their own visualizations and try to ask them what they were using it for. And so a lot of people used color signaling. Um, we did a collaborative editing and they said, oh, you know, use yellow for highlighting, red for making changes. And so you can start to kind of think about, you know, additions to the gaze visualization that can signal maybe what I'm trying to do. Um, you could try to signal maybe mood in that sense. Um, so potentially ways to add on in subtle ways to this cue through things like color change um, could be an interesting way to not drastically add too much to the space, but also provide it more of a cue. I think there's also room for, you know, with the pair programming example, we're using some unused space in the margin, thinking about potentially other areas for unused space. Um, the last visualization with the multiple students was also showing their position in the document in the scroll bar. And so you can start to think about putting other types of information in the scroll bar, um, like, you know, student, like maybe potentially, you know, high focus points when students are being particularly engaged in certain areas. So I think there's a lot of opportunities, but it is going to be a tough question. <laughs> yeah. Was your design as, all of your designs share the common feature that they're overlays and you're trying to keep them subtle, maybe as what Corey's talking about, mm -hmm. not overwhelming people. Did, did you settle on that because of technical limitations where that was the easiest, are, are those the easiest ways to introduce the visualization as opposed to, I don't know, like you could have, uh, you know, the, the area where people are looking in the code, you could have enlarged and made a bigger font, right? Or something. Right. Um, yeah, so we started with the overlay initially because it was one of the more easy technical implementations. You can just kind of put this on top of what you're working on. But it has gotten more complex with the, the Visual Studio example that was inside of the editor. Um, and so you could think about you know, doing more manipulation of what people are working on. The issue, I think, is why, why I haven't gotten to that specifically is just when you start to disrupt the space that people are actually working in, since eye gaze can be a little bit noisy and all over the place, do we risk you know, potentially creating a very disruptive environment where things are changing a lot. Um, so I've avoided changing the actual space due to that, but I think that there is an opportunity to be more subtle and integrate it into the workspace in more effective ways, like with the Visual Studio example or in the scroll bar. So I think that, that it just requires a little bit more work in terms of what context it supports, and then it kind of deeply centers you in that context track. With some of these visualizations, you can apply them to any 
task that you want to. Yeah. I'm wondering what the some of the group potential group work you'd be doing um, if beyond say tracking their attention, you could have things like an alert, like the audience you're losing the audience because people aren't really paying attention, or um, right. maybe a meeting, uh, some kind of assessment of whether people are maybe tired and maybe can conclude the meeting, things like that, which are nonverbal and uh, maybe a step beyond what you've done so far. Yeah, I think that, that that's an interesting, an interesting avenue when we think about like putting this information together. Like, are you not looking at the screen because you're tired or bored or are you actually really thinking really hard and some people look up when they're thinking, right? And so trying to distinguish those types of behaviors where it's like, I can take your eye gaze for what it's worth, but contextualizing the fact that you're falling asleep or feeling bored, that's going to be a different signal to me than just the eye gaze itself. So I think that that's a really interesting opportunity for you know, expressing more information that isn't just exactly where you're looking. And when you think about potentially like teacher examples, you know, the student is feeling frustrated. It's not that they very much understand this content, it's that they don't understand it. So trying to tease apart the coordinates from the behavior, I think, is an interesting question. And I, I think it would get more rich if you did integrate this. Yeah. Did you try, um, sorry, I missed some of your talks, I don't know what to try. But um, did you try just highlighting a region that different users were working in such that you wouldn't create the distraction of a moving bubble or whatever? Like highlighting the text? Yeah, well, just kind of just subtly bringing in, you know, someone's attention in a particular few lines of code such that you it wasn't moving as much right. so that you could see that someone was looking at it, that you could easily ignore it and move somewhere else. Yeah, so there's been, there's been some interesting work. Um, they call it subtle gaze direction, where they discolor a portion of the screen in your periphery, and that'll attract your attention to it. And by the time you look there, the visualization goes away. So it kind of, it's been used more for training exercises where you can direct people to certain areas. Um, the reason that we've done maybe more direct cues is, is just for these current studies you know, we're, we're telling people that we're going to show you where you're looking. We're hoping that they make use of the queue. So we've made it a little bit more explicit to them um, so they know how to use it. Sometimes with the less explicit ones, you kind of require that people... I think it would be an interesting way to go once people get more familiar with the gaze visualization. Then it can kind of fade into the background. I know where it is and when to use it. Um, for these initial studies with novices, we just designed them to be more explicit so we could point them out to them and they could make use of it. Um, but I think that that's an interesting question and it has been explored a little bit, but I think it could benefit from further. Yes, you, you have the tension of any moving stimulus will attract someone else's right. gaze. So you have to trade off between showing where someone's looking without adding that noise. Right, because you are going to attract yeah. someone else to it. Which is, I think, the, one of the strengths of the, the Visual Studio visualization is that it didn't happen in the document, so I wasn't kind of forcing you to look I, you only look to that margin when you were trying to understand where your partner was looking. So in that way, um, it kind of achieved that. Yes. Yeah. So a lot of your case visualizations address the issue of the task of visual search or shared visual search, but I'm curious as to how do they extend to a shared visual comparison? So instead of, hey, look over here, it's, hey, this one's better than this one. And so by inherently, that involves like a, a bouncing between two or more targets. So mm -hmm. I'm wondering if some of these gaze visualizations are better than others for that task, or have you thought about that at all? Yeah, um, so I thought about that a little bit. Um, the context which I thought about it is having people look at graphs where you're trying to distinguish like a main effect from an interaction, where you have to make sorry um, those different kind of jumps. And I think similar to the cloud lecture, visualizations that show connections help with that, um, where if the past information is important to you, then showing how you made that connection is going to be important. If the way that you're traversing the space is important, then having an extended line is going to help. It runs the risk of becoming more disruptive, but potentially, you know, if you're, if you're doing something more asynchronously or if that information is really important to highlight, then making the past information more apparent, which is something that I haven't done in these, um, but I think is, would be necessary if the comparison point, because you can draw physical lines. Or show multiple in code blocks highlighting back and forth. Right, yeah. And the heat map one, I think, is not the ideal visualization technique, but it does have some of those affordances where, you know, I'm showing you where I was looking for a long time and then where I looked next for a long time, and then you kind of see these two connections where I went from this space to the space, and those two are important. Yeah. 
that's a great one. Any more questions? All right, well, let's thank Sarah.